innovative and interesting times. Today's stories. The Lima Group presses for an electoral solution to the Venezuelan crisis. Netanyahu says without Israel, the entire Middle East will collapse. A WHO official reacts to DR Congo's health minister's resignation. Finland's UPM announces the country's biggest investment in Uruguay. Migrants rejected by the United States await in Mexico to go back home. The DA agent on bringing down the almost untouchable El Chapo. Mark Esper is sworn in as Defense Secretary. Plus, E3 Day 3, the video game community breaks down barriers. Hello everyone, I am Eliza Gonzalez Manglikmot bringing you stories from around the globe. And this is Eagle News, broadcasting from Washington, D.C. The Lima Group urged Venezuela's government to not delay the calling of presidential elections and threatened President Nicolas Maduro with pressure measures and additional sanctions as left-wing activists demonstrated outside the foreign ministry where the meeting of the Lima Group took place. Para el Grupo de Lima, una convocatoria anticipada del mandato de la Asamblea Nacional es una clara línea roja que nosotros no querríamos ver ultrapasar. Está Maduro también, creemos nosotros que Maduro es parte del problema del pueblo venezolano, porque un país rico lo han llevado completamente a un desastre, hay una corrupción tremenda, pero creemos que es el pueblo el que tiene que solucionar los problemas, no Estados Unidos ni este grupo de personajes que de democrático tienen poco, porque... The Lima Group on Tuesday said Venezuela's political crisis threatened regional peace and international security and urged the global community to make a huge effort to re-establish democracy in the South American country. The group of a dozen Latin American countries and Canada helping to mediate the Venezuelan crisis urged the world to push Caracas to hold new presidential elections, a move socialist leader Nicolas Maduro has refused to consider. Venezuela was thrust into a political impasse six months ago when opposition leader Juan Guaido declared himself acting president after branding Maduro a usurper because of his fraudulent 2018 re-election. Government opposition talks are stalled as Guaido, recognized by more than 50 countries, is demanding that Maduro step down and hold new elections. Argentine Foreign Minister Jorge Fauri at the Lima Group meeting in Buenos Aires said, quote, while a dictator is in power in Venezuela, all our democracies are more fragile. E instan a la dictadura de Nicolás Maduro a no utilizar dichos procesos para dilatar la convocatoria de elecciones presidenciales con todas las garantías, a la mayor brevedad posible. En caso de no alcanzarse ese objetivo, se impondrán medidas de presión y sanciones adicionales. He said the Venezuelan crisis threatens regional peace and security, as well as international security. Most Lima Group members recognize Guaido, who participated by video link. According to the United Nations, a quarter of Venezuela's 30 million people are in need of humanitarian aid, while 3 million have left the country since early 2016. Colombia has taken in 1.3 million Venezuelans, while another 768,000 live in Peru. Nestor Popolizio, Peru's foreign minister, asked for, quote, urgent and concrete help in the form of international cooperation to relieve the burden of countries hosting the migrants. Popolizio said the crisis is worsening and requires an urgent solution in the form of credible, transparent, free and fair elections. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said during a meeting in Jerusalem with the U.S. Energy Secretary Rick Perry that without Israel, the entire Middle East will collapse to the forces of Islamic radicalism. Without Israel, Without, with, without the things that we do and the things that we stand for and the things that we protect, I think the entire Middle East would collapse to the forces of uh, Islamic radicalism, whether Shiite led by Iran uh, or Sunni radicalism led by uh, 
by Daesh. I think that uh, we cannot allow Iran to disrupt the flow of oil in international waters. And again, I think the, the first requirement are those, uh, the application of still greater pressure uh, on Iran. If I had to say what are the three things that we have to do in the face of Iranian aggression, it is pressure, pressure, and more pressure to force Iran to abandon its uh, uh, nuclear and uh, regional ambitions. Our advancements in energy production, uh, they're historic. But besides producing that energy, we've got to ensure its delivery. And uh, there are bad actors out there. You mentioned one of them earlier. Um, Iran and others would love to disrupt that delivery through cyber attacks. The World Health Organization Deputy Director General says the Ebola response team, quote, has enjoyed working with DR Congo's health minister following his resignation over concerns on a proposed experiment with a new vaccine. Ibrahima Soche Fall added that the WHO recommends clinical trials for new Ebola vaccine candidates. Donc, nous avons apprécié la collaboration avec le ministre qui a été sur tous les fronts depuis le début de l'épidémie. Mais nous travaillons dans un contexte you know, extrêmement complexe. Nous avons vu les problèmes de sécurité, nous avons vu la faiblesse du système de santé dans cette zone, les besoins des communautés. Donc, ce n'est pas réellement une question de, de personne, c'est des, des défis de système. Et je ne pense pas qu'il y ait eu des problèmes de leadership. Le ministre était présent partout où il était attendu. Ces équipes étaient décentralisées et donc au niveau des sous-coordinations, etc. Mais quand on regarde les choses, toutes les équipes n'ont pas les mêmes capacités. À chaque fois, il a fallu faire des ajustements pour avoir les bonnes capacités au niveau du terrain surtout. Le plus important pour moi, c'est d'avoir les vraies capacités en front line, au niveau air de santé. L'OMS est au courant de toutes les étapes sur la recherche sur la vaccination. C'est pour cette raison que le vaccin qu'on utilise actuellement, mais qui est un candidat à vaccin, a été recommandé par le comité de sages. Pour les autres vaccins, que ce soit le vaccin Johnson Johnson ou d'autres candidats à vaccin, l'OMS recommande fortement les essais cliniques, qu'on puisse avancer sur les essais cliniques pour avoir donc plus d'informations sur l'efficacité, sur l'inocuité, etc. Donc, il faut... Mais nous sommes plus donc, sur le terrain, sur les aspects opérationnels. Mais ce qui est important pour nous, OMS, c'est d'accompagner le pays sur la base de structures mises en place et d'arriver à contenir l'épidémie avec les partenaires. DR Congo's health minister resigned Monday, citing his removal as the head of his country's Ebola response and concerns over a proposed experiment with a new unlicensed vaccine. Ilunga objected to suggestions, quote, by actors who have demonstrated a clear lack of ethics to introduce a second vaccine to the country's fight against the highly infectious hemorrhagic virus disease. He wrote, quote, strong pressure has been exerted for several months to roll out a new experiment in the DR Congo. Chisikedi on Saturday replaced Ilunga as the head of the country's response to the latest Ebola epidemic, which has killed more than 1,700 people. Nearly 170,000 people have been given an Ebola vaccine manufactured by German pharma giant Merck since the outbreak started in Democratic Republic of Congo a year ago. The World Health Organization has been pushing for the introduction of a second vaccine produced by a subsidiary of U.S. company Johnson & Johnson. Johnson, but the health ministry under Ilunga has resisted such a move, citing the risks of introducing a new product in communities where mistrust of Ebola responders is already high. The Merck vaccine is tested but unlicensed, while the second drug is still in the trial investigation stage. Ilunga, a medical doctor, said it would be unrealistic to believe that the new vaccine, proposed by actors who have demonstrated a clear lack of ethics by voluntarily hiding important information from health authorities, could have a decisive impact on the control of the epidemic. He did not refer to anyone by name. On Saturday, Saturday, the presidency announced that coordination of the anti-Ebola campaign would now fall under Shisekedi's direct supervision. This came shortly after the WHO gave the outbreak the high alert status of public health emergency of international concern.
Finnish company UPM announced it will go ahead with plans to invest more than $3 billion to build a pulp plant in Uruguay, calling it the biggest investment the company has ever made. This investment is the, the biggest uh, company has ever made. I think it's biggest also the, the forestry sector in Finland has ever made. And, uh, and the thirdly, I think it's also the biggest investment made here in Uruguay. The highly competitive uh, mill investment is uh, 2.7 uh, billion US dollars and it will grow uh, UPM's current pulp uh, capacity uh, more than 50 percent. So the mill is scheduled to start up uh, in the second half of 2022. Uh, company will invest 280 million dollars uh, to construct the deep sea port terminal in Montevideo. Coming up. Migrants rejected by the United States await in Mexico to go back home. The DEA agent on bringing down the almost untouchable El Chapo. Mark Esper is sworn in as defense secretary. Plus, E3 Day 3, the video game community breaks down barriers. Eagle News will be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back. You are watching Eagle News. A group of 70 migrants rejected by the United States awaited in Mexico their political asylum process under the Permanecer in Mexico or Stay in Mexico program of the Migrant Protection Protocols or the MPP so that rejected migrants can return to Honduras voluntarily when they arrive at the Casa del Migrante in Ciudad Juarez. Bueno, porque pensamos que es lo mejor. Aquí creo que no se hace nada. Si creo que es así, es una mentira. Porque cuando yo salí de mi país, Honduras, mi deseo era poder cruzar el territorio norteamericano. Desgraciadamente, pues no, no, no pudimos lograr. From 2012, DEA Special Agent Ray Donovan spearheaded the investigation of the Sinaloa cartel that resulted in the arrest of Mexican drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, who was sentenced to life in prison last week. Donovan, who worked from Virginia to coordinate efforts to track down Guzman in Mexico, said the Sinaloa cartel continues to control the drug distribution markets in the United States. Um, when we started to pursue him, he started moving. He didn't stay still, and so it was a challenge. Um, when we finally approached the house where we knew he was staying at is when he went down to the tunnel in the sewage system. Well, what people may not know is that although he went into the tunnel system, there was another steel door at the bottom of the staircase below the bathtub. He was there with, another, with a female and with another individual waiting to see if the Marines would come all the way down. As the Marines were going down the staircases when they fled. From there, they fled to Masalan, to northern Masalan, to one beach resort. They stayed there for about two days and then they ended up in the Miramar Hotel. All along, we're passing information um, between Mexico and the United States law enforcement. We're sharing the information. And um, after he fled from Culiacan, we had no information to share. We really didn't know. We had an idea he went to Masalan. Eventually, a phone number came back up on the radar that we were looking at that placed him down in Masalan. Guzman, considered the most powerful drug lord on the planet after Colombian Pablo Escobar was killed in a police shootout in 1993, has been sentenced to life behind bars nearly two decades after he first escaped from a Mexican jail in a cart of dirty laundry. It took a massive team and years of work that saw Donovan manage to identify Guzman's suppliers and partners, along with hitmen, lawyers, and lovers, intel that led to captures in 2014 and 2016. According to Donovan, the New York Chief for the Drug Enforcement Administration, or DEA, he now even knows how the kingpin thinks. Guzman's confinement in a maximum security prison located in Colorado's mountain desert brings things full circle for Donovan. 
uh, I don't think many people believe that we could capture him. Um, because here it is, this myth that uh, he was almost uh, untouchable. And, um, and, and we believe, though. And I say we because there was a team of people that absolutely believed that if we put everything together and we pursued him relentlessly, we would capture him. So the Sinaloa cartel still controls the vast majority of drug distribution, illicit drug distribution markets in the United States, but the cartel new generation is equally, if not more powerful today than ever before. In February 2014, as head of the DEA Special Operations Division in Virginia, Donovan oversaw the operation that led to Guzman's arrest in the Pacific Beach Resort Mazatlan in the crime boss's home region of Sinaloa. But El Chapo escaped yet again that July, this time through a 1.5-kilometer tunnel. Mexican Marines recaptured Guzman in January 2016. He said of that force, they are the crown jewels. They are Mexican national heroes. If it wasn't for them and their partnership, their willingness to collaborate with us, there's no way El Chapo would be in Colorado today. It took coordinated effort between 22 different U.S. government agencies and Mexico, hundreds of people who Donovan said put their egos aside in pursuit of a common goal, arrest the drug lord accused of trafficking or attempting to move more than 1,250 tons of drugs side over a quarter century. The special agent said that El Chapo was also very influential in exposing the United States to fentanyl, lacing heroin with the potent and often fatal drug and helping to foster the current opioid crisis. Donovan's next target is RCQ or Rafael Caro Quintero, the co-founder of the now disbanded Guadalajara cartel, who in 1985 ordered the murder of DEA agent Enrique Camarena in Mexico after performing blood-curdling torture on him. The drug lord, lord that we want to capture the most is RCQ, Rafael Caro Quintero. Uh, because of him, uh, Kiki Camarena, DEA agent, was killed in 1985. And uh, until he's apprehended, DEA will not stop. Former soldier Mark Esper was sworn in as U.S. Secretary of Defense Tuesday after earning Senate confirmation, filling America's longest ever Pentagon leadership vacuum as Washington faces mounting tensions with Iran and struggles to end the long-running Afghanistan war. President Donald Trump's second Defense Department chief takes over nearly seven months after the shock departure of Jim Mattis, the deeply respected career U.S. Marine who broke with Trump over policy on the Middle East and Afghanistan. Two others were made acting defense secretary this year to fill the void, including Patrick Shanahan, who served a six-month temporary stint but resigned for family reasons in June and withdrew from consideration for the full-time top post. Esper sailed through the confirmation process at lightning speed. He earned broad bipartisan support and was confirmed by a vote of 90 to 8. Later Tuesday, he was sworn in at the Oval Office ceremony attended by several Senate Republicans and President Trump, who called it a very important day for the nation. There's no one more qualified to lead the Department of Defense than Mark Esper, a West Point graduate, great student actually, Secretary Esper served our military for 21 years, including in the Gulf War. I am confident that he will be an outstanding Secretary of Defense. I have absolutely no doubt about it. He is outstanding in every way, and we're honored to have you aboard. Esper's confirmation brings ballast to a Pentagon destabilized by the leadership revolving door since late December and comes as the world's primary military power is engaged in conflicts in countries, including Afghanistan, and is being tested by Tehran. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, the top Republican in Congress, hailed Esper, who served a two-year stint as Secretary of the U.S. Army beginning in 2017, as a thoroughly well-prepared nominee who has the respect of the national security community and can hit the ground running. It is an honor of a lifetime to be appointed Secretary of Defense and to lead the greatest military in history. And I will do so with that same energy and commitment to duty, honor, and country that I have for nearly four decades since my early days at West Point. 
We now take you to the Electronic Entertainment Expo in Los Angeles, where we will find out how the gaming industry breaks down barriers in both the real and the virtual worlds. Eva and Alan Basilahe with the story. At the E3 Esports Zone, a 10,000 square foot area has been designed for professional and amateur competitors to battle it out in tournaments for games like NBA 2K, Fortnite, and Smash Brothers Ultimate. And with this being the final day of E3 2019, we want to jump in post haste with a little esports competitive play and, of course, still find time to review some video game goodness on the show floor. In esports, there's many different games from um, a Madden NFL football game to a game like League of Legends or Counter Strike, which is a first person shooter game. And, and uh, for enjoyment and, and for community, people play these games because they, they spend time with their friends online playing with them. They play to get achievements and to, um, to be the best at what they do. And, and once you start playing in that way, it, it, it really fills your life with, uh, with joy and also companionship from the community of the games you play. Esports in college is becoming a, a, a part of the infrastructure of college. So you can go to college now to play for the basketball team or the soccer team or the esports team. It's growing a lot in the college scene because, you know, college people have good reflexes and a lot of time. So it's basically just a new form of competition. So the people here seem like really in invested, I think, because it's the kind of thing where you're like, oh, I'm pretty good at Smash, but then you get to see like people who are good, and it's like, whoa, they're doing crazy stuff. I practice uh, maybe about be before a tournament, uh, about a good four or five hours. I gotta make sure I know all my techniques. I gotta make sure I know everything about my character, about all my opponents as much as I can. Um, this game, I have to know about maybe around 70, 75 different characters, you have to know. I have made so many friends and had so many great experiences because of esports. And uh, overall, it just makes me, I feel, a better person. E3 wouldn't be complete without the occasional photo op. Or the obligatory wipeout in front of friends. Ready for any challenge? Our Eagle News team dared to scale the highest peaks in order to deliver the latest in video gaming news. News about upcoming games like... Yeah, Star Wars Pinball is coming out for Nintendo Switch on September 13th. It's the first Star Wars game on the Nintendo Switch. Uh, it takes 19 great Star Wars tables, puts them all into one package. One of the cool things you can do is you, you choose your side. Are you light side or are you dark side? Which are you? Uh, we pick the exciting side. <laughs> dark side it is. In career mode, you actually like have to fulfill these missions just like right uh, right then and there. There's also stuff like a five minute challenge, like get a certain amount of points. Single player is just all of our tables there. Uh, league play and galactic tournaments are different, like on online kind of things you can do. We have a cantina jukebox, which is uh, you'll unlock all these different John Williams uh, themes and everything. You can play them anytime you like. Eventually you'll get to play out great scenes, like iconic scenes, like, you know, the Millennium Falcon going through the asteroid fields or uh, Luke on Hoth and stuff like that. There's all sorts of uh, fun, iconic scenes. That pretty much goes for all the kind of movie adaptation tables that we have. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into the battle mode. This is like a, a very classic kind of castle storm fight and just like totally bombard this castle oh, so wait. that you get a nice look at our destruction, which is all Unreal 4 driven. You reveal like little humorous scenes, like you get a little zombie in a hamster wheel there. The, the Headless Horseman is here and but just admiring himself. We have a little uh, bone throne down here. It's not an iron throne, it's a bone throne. The actual objective is to totally either destroy this castle or to get this flag here and take it all the way back. So we're showing off Sea of Thieves here at the stand today. We've got the arena mode, which is uh, our recently released uh, like competitive game mode that we've launched as part of our anniversary edition update. You've got short session-based combat and you can jump in and play with your friends and you can kind of experience that PvP experience. But then on the other side, we've also delivered the 
Tall Tales, a, a quest-based system over to the adventure mode. So while we had the emergent world out at launch, um, we've added a range of kind of story-based quests and campaigns, and it was all based on following from player feedback. Feedback about E3 was also an important discussion, engaging the prominence of the world's most well-known video game expo. All these exhibits are amazing, from the Nintendo booth, the Link's Awakening, if you haven't seen that, the little figurines on top, it's just been mind-boggling. Pokemon's great, and if you haven't checked out the indie area, there's a lot of good gems over in the indie area to check out. The Nintendo booth was definitely fun, that's what we came here for. Um, so we went and played Pokemon, and we played, uh, what else did we get to play? Luigi's Mansion, Luigi's Mansion, really, really great game, um, and then I've just come here on the last day to check out the Xbox and see what uh, the streaming service is going to be like. So it's been good. I recommend that, that's pretty amazing. This is the show. This is the show where everything is announced. We get to see the updates for our favorite titles. We get big surprises and just everyone is psyched about the future of video games. I'm a very big like Xbox channel. So I'll be talking about Xbox games I played. Uh, Gears of War as well. I got some footage of that. So I'm very excited to talk about that. I'm very impressed by it. And yeah, E3 is a very busy place. I love it. But if you ever get the chance to come, give it a shot. With consoles and computers promising even more devastatingly beautiful graphics, richer stories, and immersive ways to play, it looks like it's time for me to upgrade to a bigger TV. But first, I'm probably going to need a bigger wall. Walls, however, are broken down in the video game community thanks to things like online play, competitive esports, and big events like E3, where regardless of any personal demographic, each individual is simply recognized as a gamer. Signing off from the Electronic Entertainment Expo at the Los Angeles Convention Center, this is Evan Allen for Eagle News, and we are one with 25. Thanks, Eva and Allen. That is today's Eagle News. Join us tomorrow for stories that matter to you. Visit our websites at eaglenews.net and eaglenewslive.com. Follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash eaglenews and on Facebook at facebook.com slash eaglenews. Thank you for watching. I am Eliza Gonzalez, Manwick Mott, and I am one with 25.